Stephen, can you explain to us uh, the name of the pyramid, which is called the Bent Pyramid? Right. Um, well, the site, according to Egyptology, is dedicated to, is to, to the Third Dynasty and to a particular king they call Seneferu. And they think that it means he of beauty, because they translate Nefer as beauty. But in Kematology, we translate Nefer as harmony. And it's well known that the Senen is double, meaning double the effect. So it means double harmony. So a great a British a Canadian scientist, Marshall McLuhan, who wrote a classic book in 1968, The Medium is the Message, came here in 1968 and looked at the Bent Pyramid with its two angles and said that structure produces two frequencies of sound. And Hakim agrees with this. Well, this is part of chematology because we're talking about each pyramid uh, uh, determined to a different frequency of sound. So it's either this red pyramid and the bent pyramid that made the term Seneferu or, se or the bent pyramid itself. But it's not a person's name. It was not a king. It is a title. It could be the title of the individuals who worked or the titles of the structure itself. Double harmony as in the name of the function of the structure. Exactly, and that's what the commissions would do. This is the entrance to the Red Pyramid. We're going down the shaft, and we're going to go into these incredible rooms, which are acoustic chambers. Forget about the idea of tombs, think sound, and vibrational technology. So this is actually inside, about 20 feet, more than 100 feet to go. Okay, now we're maybe a third of the way in. And Yusuf Awiyan, the dark figure, is about to come past okay, Maybe halfway down now, and the heat is already starting to, to pick up in here, as well as the heat generated by uh, anticipation and awe. Okay, so we're at the bottom of the descending passageway. It's got to be 90 degrees Fahrenheit in here right now. And now we're going sideways. So we're inside the first of the of the main chambers of the Red Pyramid. And it is tuned to A. That seems to be the sound that it likes the best. A. What? So if this was a tomb, why would it be tuned, theoretically, to the note A? But if it was a vibrational or sound, sense that there would be a frequency that was very particular to the interior like this. into the second of the chambers here. And the sides of them taper in with these almost baffle-like stones. And of course that is, it could be actually an acoustic cone filter of some kind. The lighting's pretty terrible, but what you can see there is a massive crack in the solid stone. And that's part of the theory, again, that this was an energy generating device, as were some of the others of the pyramids on the Giza Plateau, and that they actually became overloaded at one point, partially exploded, and then shut down. And as hard as it may be imagined to believe, we could be talking about that explosion occurring about 12,000 years ago at the end of the last ice age. And in the interior here, Look at the fineness of the joinery. There. You can't fit a human hair. And then we go up five floors.
flights of stairs and we reach another chamber, the third. It's smaller, but still, it, it looks like a cone filter too. So we're up five flights of stairs and it's tall enough to walk through, but the smell of bat dung is almost unbearable. So this one actually has 13 baffles. 15? Yeah, the other two had 11, I think. Yeah. Again, the tightness of the joinery here, the tightness of the fit. This has um, a, a kerf in it, so it doesn't look super high quality, but this shows you that these fit right next to each other. The stone is limestone, but it has a lot of what seems to be crystal in its structure. The surface of the stone is stippled, meaning it's not completely flat, but I can't see. These look like tool marks, but what kind of tool? Is it a punch or what was used? But again, this is a chamber and it's perpendicular to the other two five flights of stairs up and the hallway is big enough for me six feet to be able to walk straight through. through. You hear that sound? So Stephen we were just in what's called the Red Pyramid and there's, there were three chambers in there. That's correct. Uh, the third one perpendicular to the others. Do you have um, words of wisdom for its original function or anything? Well, yes of course. It's a, as we did our toning and chanting in there, the resonance of sound is, a, is a tremendous in the first two chambers. But what's key about the upper chamber is that when we look down we see massive water erosion and we're told that's where the water came in. And so what we continue is the, the link of all the pyramids is water was the source of the energy and the acoustics the harmony was there to work on the bonds of water to break it into hydrogen and oxygen and that's key in the Great Pyramid but even here the water was used to produce the electromagnetic fields with the residents to continue this, that pyramid humming as a machine and as we have said each pyramid was tuned to a different frequency of sound. So we are presently underground this is the bedrock limestone ancient ocean and what we're at is we're at the entrance to what is called the Serapium in Egypt, at the Saqqara site. The Serapium contains 28 or 29 massive niches inside a tunnel system, and within at least 20 of those niches are massive stone boxes. The lid and the box combined, in each case, weighs upwards of 100 tons. And so I brought this in order to see how flat the surfaces are. And here we are. We are in the Serapium underground. And these are the niches containing the massive boxes. So this is where you see the scale of these boxes that are so called sarcophagi. However, this box could not have fit around this corner to get where it is. So that's one of the mysteries here at the Serapium. Again, the box by itself weighs about 70 tons and the lid, if there was one, would weigh probably at least 20 tons. And the stone is pink or rose granite that comes from uh, Aswan, which is 500 miles. So conventional Egyptologists say that these were the ceremonial burial places of prized Apis bulls. However, no bull was ever found inside of one of them. Neither was a human being. They're too big to be a coffin. So what was their function? Read the chambers and everything and also align it with the north magnet pole 
you know, there has to be a connection between this and the pyramid because they are all also aligned with the North Magnet Pole. So I think of the Serapium not just as a huge place on its own. I think of it as uh, evidence that can tell us what kind of construction was laid underground. What kind of, you know, when we see the here, advanced machining, megalithic pieces of stones and all these elements, alignment with the North Magnet Pole as well, then we know that this, the same mentality, the same knowledge that created this is the same one that created the pyramids. And that we can think of this as the lower part or the underground part of the same complex. Absolutely. Which is another proof that the shafts and the tunnels at the Great Pyramid is nothing but an extension of the same and here we go again. This is black or gray granite. And you see the beauty of the interior finish of it. I'm uh, going. The other amazing thing about these boxes is the lid and the box itself are cut from the same piece of stone. The engineer Chris Dunn believes that, in fact, the finishing work had to have been done underground because of uh, stability of temperature. If it was done on the surface, the stone will expand and contract during the daytime. So possibly the block was actually moved underground and then the carving was done. But the problem with that is, how did they light this place? There is no evidence of soot or smoke on the ceiling or anywhere in here. And so it's unlikely that torches were used. So, did they have electricity? Here we have another one of the boxes. Again, the lid and the box itself are made from the same piece of stone. And it's at least 10 feet, if not 12 feet long. One of many. And here, for a sense of scale, Yeah, just a, absolutely wild. And here for a sense of scale. Yeah, just a, absolutely wild. Mohammed. <laughs> Please explain what these things are. <laughs> you are talking with the box? Yes. Okay. Um, this is a huge box, as you can see, made out of granite, most of it from granite, very few from diorite, and one uh, from limestone. The uh, story, the famous story saying this is like a sarcophagus to bury the body of the holy bull worshipped in the late time of Egypt by the Egyptians and the Greeks. Uh -huh. That's why it got a Greek name called Serapis. But according to what we can see, that no mummy of a bull or skeleton or other stuff were found. It was all found empty. Uh -huh. Only one was found intact, but according to August Mariette only. And we don't know where are the things were inside. Uh -huh. And August Mariette used gunpowder to uh, make his way inside the sarcophagus, uh -huh. the box. But as you can see, this box, uh, how come it will serve a pull? Because it's still bigger, at least four times than a bull size. Right. So they, they used the, the uh, modern explanation that this is a big size, bigger than the coffins we see in the Valley of the Kings tombs, to say the other sarcophagus for humans, but this big size for the pull. Right. Which it doesn't make sense because if you put the pull, there will be a big space empty. Right. So it could be smaller. And why this size of the cover? And why the big size and the height of the, uh, the box itself? Uh -huh. And also why different materials? Why they didn't make it all from limestone or all from granite? And why did they make the lid? <laughs> I mean, so theoretically, the lid and the box are from the same piece of stone. Yes, it's a must because they believe that if it does have magnetic field or power, uh -huh. it must be to be from the same thing so they don't make any interruption in this magnetic field. So they cut a big piece of granite or uh -huh. even limestone and from the back side of this piece, they cut the cover or the lid.
okay? Right. That's why if any mistake will happen through cutting the lid, we're going to change the whole box. And this is, there is a, a famous piece in the Egyptian museum telling this. We call it unfinished box because when they were, were cutting the, uh, the cover, they, they break it into two halves. That's why they left it. They didn't care to continue finishing this because they need to make the cover from the same piece of a stone. So this one we actually get to climb down and examine close up. And the rose quartz are higher. Rose quartz is a high percentage. Higher than So they especially favor rose quartz. So what you're looking at is quite a flat surface. Christopher Dunn is the one who discovered how accurate this stuff is. This dust and, put it again. and what he found out, in fact, is that there are surfaces in at least one of these which is within two ten thousandths of an inch of being laser flat. You can re put it up here because the uh, town's got all the statistics now. Great. It's 11 and a half feet long. Okay, perfect. Uh, seven inches, seven, seven feet. And then to the top is another four feet. One theory that believes that uh, the Giza pyramids and others in the area were actually part of an energy device uh, of some kind, an acoustic or vibrational generator, and that these boxes could possibly have been either capacitors or batteries for storage of energy. But the thing is, what we're looking at is something we don't understand in the 21st century. We've always been led to believe that we are the, the greatest of all creation. We are the most intelligent, most sophisticated of the human species. But what we saw there could be evidence of lost ancient high technology, <coughs> excuse me, lost ancient high technology of an order that we simply cannot. Con it's very difficult to film in here because the lighting is quite poor um, and there isn't a lot of space. But to give you a sense of scale, there are two people chanting inside one of these. attempting to do was to find the one note or frequency which causes their voices to go louder and what that tells us is that tells us the frequency of the box itself or at least uh, the tone that the box prefers compared to others we were in the what's called the bent pyramid earlier today and the tone inside of one of the chambers in there <clears throat> which was a large room so-called tomb was tuned to A so I'm not sure what the tune or tone of that one is but uh, the Serapium underground in Egypt so Stephen we were just in the Serapium we know the conventional story of what most Egyptologists think the function of those boxes were but what is the Kemet school idea? Well, you know, this is one of the unknowns even to us, but it's clear that what we think about these stone boxes is that they were used for resonance, for sound. And uh, it's a different stone, the different dimensions, the geometry is all important, and uh, nothing was ever found inside these boxes, so we believe that they were used for resonance, for sound transmission. Uh, Chris Dunn calls the, the, the uh, Great Pyramid a power plant. In my opinion, I just think the uh, Serapium was a power station. Uh, we, we know that there's 33 niches, so at least 33 boxes, 27 still intact. Many have been destroyed and damaged. There's very few that are completely intact. Uh, but we think that maybe it extends out, we know, to the, to the east, to, to uh, Memphis, and to the west, probably far out into the desert. It's also possible that there's another level. So this is just the beginning. This, we just scratched the surface of this incredible site. This site needs to be intensely investigated, <laughs> measured, uh, documented, by by serious uh, researchers and scientists because no one has really done the work here. I don't have a clue where we're going, but Yusuf Awian is guiding us, so it should be 
interesting. The location we're at is called Saqqara, which is a massive archaeological center here, still on the, what you would basically call the Giza Plateau area in Egypt. Okay, so we're actually going underground. No. Is it huh? No. Accompanied by Dr. Stephen Mailer <laughs> of the chemist school and Yusuf Awiyan, who is the guide. So you see all this reinforcement here to stabilize the tunnel we're about to enter. This is so ancient. So. Don't step on the jars, please. These are antiquities, you know. Oh, these. Look at the pattern. Wow. Can you just take the whole chapter? Side room cut out of the solid bedrock. So we actually just saw two side chambers that had tombs in them. Bones. We need to do mine if we're going to do it. This is not all of it, actually. This is not all of it. No, it is much more. So you're saying that this tunnel system labyrinth just keeps going, but it's it been does. filled in by sand. Yes. Huh. Oh, yeah? Yeah. The network of tunnels. Absolute special access. Today we get to enter the tomb of Maya. Stephen, please. Well, this is a chapel or a temple of Maya. Now, Maya was a title, not a name, of both men and women throughout dynastic times. This particular era is around the 18th dynasty, the time of the so-called King Horemheb. Now, the key thing here is 1997, Hakim came to the United States to California. He and my research partner, Bob Butter, and I met him for a couple of weeks and we discussed. One of the things he discussed on a return trip to Egypt in September of 1997 would be, he said, he would show us evidence of a Mayan temple in Egypt. Mayan as in culture. Exactly. And I said, this I never heard of. No, it's not in any text. No one has ever mentioned <coughs> Okay. We came here. This was arranged differently then. A lot of this is new construction. It was not this way in 1997. Uh, first of all, I looked on the wall. Behind you, you see... And that is Maya, but it looks typically commissioned. Right. And I'm looking around, typically commissioned. All it looks. So Hakim would use the expression, well, you know, Stephen, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. He's living in Kemet. He's going to pass in Kemet. So he's betraying himself as a commission. So I said, well, Papa, this is great, but I can't go with this in front of an academic audience. They'll laugh me off the stage. There's nothing here to identify with the culture we're talking about. Uh, but then there was a keeper like this gentleman here, was here, didn't speak any English, but saw that I was perplexed. He said, come here. This then was boarded up with just a wooden door, and it was latched there. He threw away the wooden slabs, opened the door, and he said, look up. Oh. And that is the key. Uh -huh. Took a picture in 1997, sent it to Mayan daykeeper Hanbat's men. He said he recognizes this as the language of the Itza people, where it's Chichen Itza. He said it's an ancient language. But a lot of people are not sure about Humboldt's men. So we went one step further. In 2010, I got to meet Dan Alejandro Sul Ojdaj. He is the wisdom keeper, the head of the Quiche Maya of all of Guatemala. I showed him this picture, and his eyes went as big as saucers. And he said to me, that is the language of my ancestors. That is a calendar. That is telling the date 
of when Maya was here. And how we can't read it, he can't even still read it, but he knows that the circles and squares and different colors and ranges and the spokes in the wheel are indications of a date. So, this has never been discussed by any Egyptologist. They cannot put this in a commission context. There is nothing, or maybe there is others that Yusuf has seen, but there's nothing like this in the rest of Egypt. So, Mayan elders recognize this as part of their culture. So now the key is, Maya, the word, is a title. Men and women had the title. Very interesting because we've talked about the difference between Egyptian, Arabic, and other Arabic. In Egypt, one of the key words for water is Maya. It is not pronounced the same way in any other Arabic country. If you went to Saudi Arabia, they would say Ma or Meh. Only in Egypt is it pronounced Maya. And it means water. So I asked Hakim, could the title Maya actually have meant, meant he who came from across the water, or ones who came from across the water? He said yes. So here is what we call diffusionism archaeology, diffusionism, diffusionism anthropology, saying that there had to be cultural contact between these individuals thousands of miles across the sea. And this is the evidence that Hakim told us that there was a Mayan living in Egypt 3,300 years ago. Let somebody else define that for me and tell me that that is Kamishan or Egyptian or dynastic or anything else. 